Hello, Katri. Hello, Alejandra. Welcome to, to this first conversation here in, in Facebook Live. Um, it's so great to see you. <laughs> Such a long time that I we know. Get to see each other. Um, I was just looking at the picture. We look so very young. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, to create these conversations to, to reconnect with, with all my friends from University of Michigan. Um, they, they were probably one of my most beautiful years of my life uh, as a musician, as a student musician. So I, I thought it would be beautiful to, to start these conversations and to know what is everybody doing. You know? For, in, in my mind, I, I, I dream to have a, a, a world where we all can, can be together with, with our own specialties you know, to make this world a, 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 a more beautiful world. So, um, so thank you for, for saying yes to this conversation. And um, I would love to, to, to know, to get people know you. So first I will start with, with, a, um, with a question which has to do where, where are you from, Katri? Ah, where am I from? <laughs> well, I grew up in, uh kind of a medium-sized town in northern Finland. Uh, the name of the town is Oulu, which is spelled O-U-L-U. -U. And uh, it's something like 160 miles south of the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty far up north there and it's by the sea. So it's not too far from the bo border to Sweden. Mm -hmm. And um, it has a professional symphony orchestra and it has a uh, conservatory, uh, but it, it's not a, a, it wasn't a huge town then. It had about maybe a little over 100,000 people. Now it's probably 200,000 people. There's a university there. Yeah. So it's a good, it's a, it was a great place to grow up. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know, small town by world standards, but you know, a really great place. But, but it's amazing to, to know that it's a, it's a, city of about 200,000 people and you have a, 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 an orchestra, you know, a university. It's yeah. pretty, pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, there, the, in Finland, you know, the arts are very supported and education is very supported. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the 50s, when they were thinking about where to put the next university, um, there, they had, there were three universities in Finland at the time, and then the, there was nothing in Northern Finland. And so it really had to do a lot with, with development of, mm -hmm. of that Northern area, you know, with great resources, but not a whole lot of infrastructure. Mm. Wonderful. And, and tell me when, when music became part of your life, how old were you? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> My, my mother's side of the family is very musical, so we have a lot of professional musicians. Uh -huh. um, and so I think I started piano when I was five. And in my own estimation, I already knew how to play it. So <laughs> when I got lessons when I was about seven, it didn't go so well because you see the teacher was trying to change me and mm. I, I did not like that. And so I quit when I was eight. Mm. But then... Um, there, uh, there's a, there's a, a really cool opportunity when you go to third grade, which is at age of nine, and you can, you can apply to a special music class that's in a normal elementary school, but there, there's more music in the curriculum than in regular curriculum, mm -hmm. and so I got into that, and I had to pick an orchestra instrument, and so, um, first I tried guitar, but I didn't like it. And then um, cello was what stuck. And, you know, belatedly it occurred to us that there were already five professional cellists in the family. And so mm. it, it, there is like a, a cello thing. Mm. So I've, I've always felt very supported by my, by my family in terms of, you know, someone picked up a bow for me and this other person gave me my, you know, cello and that kind of thing. Right. It was a, a, a common language there. Yes, very much. 
and my mom was a piano teacher for a time so mm -hmm. music was always kind of part it was just something that we did it wasn't a separate and, and i remember you also have some uh, you have sisters right yes, i have two sisters yeah, i remember do they do they did they also learn uh, music or when 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 as a child yes we all took lessons um i think they both tried violin mm -hmm. but it didn't stick and then um my middle sister her instrument is flute and she still sometimes plays um but she's she's more of a she betters the world in other ways she's working for a children's rights organization right now um so she works for you know, for an, a non-government organization that particularly looks after girls rights in mm -hmm underdevelopment uh, underdeveloped parts of the world and um my youngest sister um almost became a professional pianist but mm -hmm. she chose otherwise she's in mm -hmm. in fashion design so it's, it's interesting that we're talking about this because you know uh, we as students at michigan we, we actually probably never had this kind of conversations to know what what your family does and right uh, it's so beautiful to 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 get to know you even more profound, you know? So it's, yeah. so it's, it's, it's great. And, well, and we knew each other on the musical level, and so that's a very profound level. But absolutely. I think you met some of my sisters, right? And I met yes. your brother. I remember. That is yeah. why I, I, I wanted to ask, no? Yeah. And um, so, Katri, tell me, how, how did Michigan come into, into the musical map of your, of your life? <laughs> why did you choose Michigan? University um, of <laughs> well, it's a really long story. I don't know how you want, how far back you want to go, like why I came to America, all those things. Yeah, how does, absolutely. How does someone from a little town in northern Finland end up here? Um, I was in a quartet in high school, actually, and somehow we had a really good chemistry together and so we got into this i guess a circuit of very good um teachers mm -hmm. so we studied in england already when we were in high school and um we studied with like amadeus quartet and borodin mm -hmm. quartet and album burke quartet um very famous people and um, we met this bow maker named thomas gray and he sort of started advocating for us um and he had a reunion just like this <laughs> 20 years after um his schoolmate from indiana university richard young who plays in the vermeer quartet mm -hmm. and richard said to him well we're looking for a grad quartet for next year we don't have anyone do you know any quartets and then tom said well actually i know a quartet they're a little younger than graduate students but maybe you should take a listen and um long story short our quartet got accepted to study with the vermeer in their program at northern illinois university um and so we went there and that's that's where i ended up doing my um undergrad and my masters mm -hmm. my teacher um was a, exactly the right teacher for me there his name is mark johnson played with the vermeer quartet he's he was sort of like he's playing in the quartet just like it was the way I really wanted to play mm -hmm. and his sound was amazing um I can still sort of envision in my mind's ear his the way his pizzicati just rang everywhere seemed to fill up the space mm -hmm. um and he was the most supportive teacher I can imagine mm -hmm. and so when I came to the end of my five years there and I, he said well I think that you know i think you can make more progress you know so you should really look for doctoral programs and um you know here's what i recommend and i was really honored that he recommended his teachers um so he recommended that i study with starker in in indiana or mm -hmm. um with ron leonard in usc um and then i had also heard very good things about erling blundahl bengtsson at michigan so um, actually the story was that one of my mom's cousins who 
he's a cellist who I who is a very close person to us. Um, he had heard Bengtsson play when he was a kid. He heard Bengtsson play in Finland, and he said, "That's what I want to do." <laughs> you know, so then you know, long story short, I auditioned, um, and I chose to go to Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's. I mean, I didn't know very much about the program otherwise, except that that's that I what, wanted to study with Bengtsson. That's what I w was want to say. That as as a intr instrumentalist, we we usually go for the teacher, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we we figure it out what the programs are, so we can actually be in the program. But yeah, it was the same situation for me with with Paul Cantor. Yeah, I just wanted to study with Paul Cantor, and he happened to be at University of Michigan. No? Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing how that works. And, and I want to say hello to Ching Chu Hu. I don't know if you remember him. Uh, Katri from the University of Michigan. He, he's a, he was a composer student there. So hello and, and thank you for, for joining us in this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, actually, Chewy was, um, is, um, we've been connected a little bit. Um, he was the guest composer for Tim Christie's festival in Walla Walla a few years ago. And it was a really good time. Mm. Hi, Chewy. <laughs> um, so tell me, tell me how it was to, to, to study with uh, Mr. Benson. What, what, what was about him that you can probably, uh, well, it happens to me that every time I, I, I practice or I touch my violin, all my teachers come into my mind yes. with, with, with different uh, concepts or, or things that you, they got, they have your signature for you. What, right. what, what did, ha, did, ha, what did he do for you in that sense? Um, I think he was a really, he was the perfect teacher for me at the time. Mm -hmm. It, even though it was a kind of a hard transition for me coming from Mark Johnson, because Mark was sort of, um, he was very much like a father. Um, and he sort of engaged my analy analytical mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it was a frustration to him because I would, you know, obsess about my pinky for, you know, three weeks <laughs> great. And then he would say, well, can we play something else in long tones next, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so when I came to Bengtsson, he, he was teaching on a much larger scope. Mm. So when I would come to lesson, expectation was that I would have a whole movement learned. And um, he was prepared. He, he taught a lot by performing. Mm. Uh, and that was one of his, um, his advice actually to me was always be one lesson ahead of your student. Mm. So, you know, as a teacher, you know what you're going to, where you're going to take them. Um, and I, so I learned a lot from his performance, but more so it was a really, he was a really philosophical teacher. So conceptual in many ways, like when I would come in with a question, like, how do I find this F here? Um, he would say, you know where it is. Ah, good. And at the time I said, well, that's a non-answer, but actually now I realize what it means, which is mm. that if I really just trust hundred percent that I know where it is, I know where it is. Cause I do, I've practiced it so many times. Um, it's that little seed of doubt in my head that makes me not hit the note. Yeah. And so yeah. I have all the things, you know, I've, I've uh, developed all the things that how, how to hit that note. And then I, the, the last step is just to really believe that I can hit that note. Um, and so those kinds of things, yes, I, I, you know, he's in my head constantly. Um, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It's, it's interesting what you're, what you're saying because, um, you know, here I, I, I do work with young musicians and, and something that I find myself repeating all the time is, or, or repeating to myself when I, when I talk to them is, is to, to, to make sure that they, they explore and they, they uh, research and search for things so you don't give them the answers all the time. Yeah. Maybe, right. maybe it might feel like a longer process or like a longer path, but at the end, it's the shortest because it's, you're finding your own voice with the instrument and, 
and thinking about about the instrument. So it's it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And and Katri Sabine Brechtschneider uh, is here also with us, and she says, "Lovely to sh to see you both, and you both have not aged." <laughs> <laughs> it's not true, <laughs> my. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sabine. Um, well, this is this is wonderful. Uh, I remember him uh, playing the Bach suites. Yeah, I, it, like marathons of all of in one concert, and so amazingly beautiful. I know. So, I, I remember that. I remember when we came to the sixth suite and to the end of the sixth suite, the last the jig, and I just felt like we should have some kind of banner that we could just like get up and make huge noise at the end because it's such a <laughs> triumphant kind of yeah i remember those moments and and you know now that i'm 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 a conductor and been conducting for a while i i remember that you share with me a, if a, a a little phrase that he told you that is still in my in my mind that i think about uh when i conduct and and that i remember he said to you something like um you have to find the right tempo and that would probably fix many things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember this moment, but I do remember it. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting how, how all these, these uh, moments of, of awakening, in a way, uh, stay with us for, for, for life, probably. No? Right. Something connects and then it just stays. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, um, so you, you, now live in an arbor you actually stayed in an arbor right yes. yeah so uh tell us Kathy, what what are you doing now these days what that keeps you in an arbor <laughs> well i'm on faculty at the university mm -hmm. um i am the head of a small music program not at the school of music but at the residential college um so there University of Michigan has different colleges and the biggest college is the College of Literature Sciences and the Arts. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of humanities umbrella. And then, um, so there's about over 20,000 students in that college. And then inside that college is this, is, are these different programs that students can choose to come in, things like Honors College and, you know, different programs and the residential college is one of those mm -hmm. and so we have our own curriculum but the students can also choose everything in LSNA or at the university that they want um, and our program is a four-year program it's the only one that that's only program that is four years it's not you know two years or you know mm -hmm. um, just part of their undergraduate career and um, so we have a two year residency requirement and all the classes are taught where the students live at East Quad. Mm. Um, and so there's a little, we have an arts practicum requirement, meaning that the students have to actually do some hands on arts. Um, they have to take a class that's three or four credits, or if it's a lower credit class, they have to repeat it a few times. Mm. And this is, you know, a really important requirement for the college and so there are little arts programs so there's a music program that um, I am the head of that program mm -hmm. and we have five faculty so mm -hmm. two of us two of the faculty are on joint appointments at School of Music so Mark Kirschenman who is also my husband we mm -hmm. share an office mm -hmm. so we really kind of have a <laughs> very good deal here um, and um, He's half time in RC and half time at School of Music. And then Michael Gould, you might remember, who was already on faculty. Um, he's a drummer mm -hmm. and does a lot of um, creativity and, you know, consciousness and creativity and uh, creative process kind of stuff in his classes. Um, and then uh, we have a Chinese music ensemble class. And then we have a voice class we just brought on that's uh, taught by Jennifer Goltz. Well, wow. Jennifer. That's, yeah. That's and so great. I'm the only one who's full time in the RC. I teach chamber music there. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's all of the chamber music for non-majors and I coordinate with school music. Sometimes I send groups there and it's a really, I mean, it's a really great job for me um, because I like to, I like to do things independently. Yeah. And so it allows for a lot of creativity in our teaching. And so because we're teaching non-majors, sometimes we have to kind of, um, not as abstract in terms of our teaching. So we, I teach yeah. a, a foundations class that really is hands-on teaching theory concepts through playing, you know, keyboards and singing. And it's kind of like everything mashed together, which I like. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's always a, a question that I, I do ask myself all the time, you know, what, what is the right way of teaching? Because there's no, there's no one, you know, like right. sometimes, I mean, as a violin student, when I was really young, I was very disciplined, you know, I will, I will do the, the five hours a day, you know, and, and, and keep a certain method of studies. And, but then, you know, you realize that, hmm, maybe if I go out of, of that system, I could find something new, you know, mm -hmm. or, or something anew. Um, so I, I, I love what you're doing because, uh, I, I feel that at least it connects with with my life now, you know, to to because I, I really feel that the arts are are everything I think in, in our in our lives, in our culture. Um, and and many many times um, especially you know the authorities don't give credit to 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 arts which is essential for for human life and for the soul, no? I agree, oh. but it's hard, it's hard to quantify. Absolutely. The and the benefits. And I think that because, um, because we don't have the metrics on how that improves the human life. Um, I mean, we have some metrics and we know that mm -hmm. actually music makes you literally smarter because it raises your IQ. Um, that, yeah. um, it, yeah, it's hard to sell it. It's hard to sell it. And we're actually in that process. There's a presidential initiative at the University of Michigan. Um, and it's amazing because it's a multi-year initiative and people at the very highest levels are talking about how to support the arts and how to make University of Michigan, you know, be a place for the arts. And I think that that's actually an incredible yeah. thing. The, the thing is that the uh, the idea of, of measuring what arts do to life is all fashion you know so it's just for, for me I, I find that it's just we need to create a new way of 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 living you know yeah. and um katri that's what i say to my students always is <laughs> you, know, you were taking a philosophy class and you didn't know that you were taking a physics class or <laughs> music is everything right exactly exactly Emily Guzman says, hello, lovely friends. And Maria Sampen, hi, Katri Alejandra, great to see and hear you. All our friends are here with us. Thank you for connecting. And, um, and thank you for really to, to be part of this. Uh, uh, like I said before to Katri, I, I, I always have this, this urge to, to create something with, with all my friends from the University of Michigan. And, and I think that this pandemic is, is a good excuse. It was a good excuse for me to, to reconnect. <laughs> so thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, Katri, so um, you, you said that, um, you, you, you talk about that, that you do chamber music, that you, you teach chamber music. How how important is chamber music for for a, a professional musician or, or for a student that is becoming a professional musician? Ah, uh, how important! Well, from my <laughs> perspective, of course, chamber music is everything. Um, I would expand that to say that even for any. Uh, non-professional student music mm. chamber music is everything i think that chamber music with the smaller numbers as we're seeing now is a lot easier to um 
it's um, e a little bit easier to manage in terms of infrastructure than an orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I find that chamber musicians, by and large, you know, there's a there are a lot of chamber musicians, but they don't always get compensated um, in the same way. That there isn't kind of a, a lar uh, larger scale understanding of what really to, how much work truly goes into making an excellent chamber music group. You know, where where you really get into the hard stuff and you kind of have an artistic vision between the three or the four people. And I mm -hmm. think that I wish that it was different. I wish that it was more supported. Um, my philosophy for my class has been that the, the students should really design their own project. I just, I just make suggestions. They always request, you know, the famous pieces and, um, you know, I always ask them for their bucket list pieces because I think it's really important to play the music that that you love and um, I try I try to enable them so I take their requests very very seriously and but now I've I've sort of challenged them a little bit and I've said you know pick one piece that you always wanted to play and then pick one piece that you didn't know before that mm -hmm. is composed by someone who maybe is. Um, a composer in the present day who is still alive or a composer um, you know or a woman composer don't always just pick the the same composers that you know because we have to also change we have to kind of not always just play the same repertoire even though it really is amazing stuff there's other amazing stuff that we have to go look for yeah um, so I think uh, that those are important things yeah you know I um... For the past two years, I created a festival called mm -hmm. the Festival uh, Portillo International Festival, and the idea of this festival is to is to have young musicians um, that they can concentrate for 10, 10 days on chamber music repertoire. Mm -hmm. So we have string quartets and woodwind quintets, nice. and they could they they can apply to the festival either individually. And they and the groups create there or as a as a form group, and it has been so amazing. Well, I, I believe that chamber music is the essence of of of, of a musician. Well, I, and of course, if you think about life, life has to do with chamber music too. You know, right. with 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 all the values that it means to to play in a, a chamber music group, and and um, so so I I am a total uh, believer on, on, on chamber music. And then it's in, it's also I have to say that um, we have done this festival for two summers and the first summer we had the Blair String Quartet. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we both know that two, two friends from the quartet used to go to University of Michigan, yep. which is a, a Steve Miyaki and uh, Felix Wong. So mm -hmm. it was so beautiful for me to, to actually Actually, it was very, very beautiful the first time we saw each other because we, we all screamed. <laughs> because suddenly we, we, we ran into each other after probably 20 years without seeing each other. So it was really, really beautiful. And that's what I mean about the, this, this idea of, of bringing all of us together. Now I, would love, I would love for this festival to grow and grow and grow and, and bring all of you to this festival. You know, to like I said before, to to really um, to nurture each other, to 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 see what everybody has to offer, uh, because this is this is a learning process, a life learning process. So it's, it was really beautiful to to have them in the in the in the first uh, year of, of the festival. Yeah, and and Katri, remember that of course you remember that we we used to play in Brave New Works. Yes, we were founding members actually of the, of the of the of the group. Tell me how how is that going um, in in these years? What are you doing? Brave New Works. Well, right now, Brave New Works is kind of, um, I would say, a little bit on hiatus. Uh, we had a, a CD out about a year ago. Um, of music by Andrew Mead and Robert Morris. 
called it's you know very very difficult music to to play um and sometimes it may be even difficult music to listen to if you don't speak the language quite yet um mm -hmm. and we haven't had a lot of performances lately i think because most everybody who is in the group now has you know jobs elsewhere and we're so far apart geographically um someday someday we'll come together Yeah, yeah. Kathy, sorry to, to cut you, but it would be nice because maybe there are people from, that are, didn't go to University of Michigan. Could you tell us what Brave New Works is? Yes. Um, um, it started at the University of Michigan when we were all students. Um, and in 1998, I believe, it was first kind of a um, collective. So there were a lot of people and we ran a festival called are you brave and the idea is that we play music where the ink is still fresh so music that is written in the present day um and in the as as close to our past as possible um we have done some you know it's amazing to think that people think of music that was written a hundred years ago as new music but it is true. Um, and so sometimes we've played old music that is still, this requires you to be brave, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's, that was the uh, original intent and I think it's still the intent of the group to do that. Um, we, after a while, after we had stopped studying and we, had, we were kind of developing our careers, we had to restructure it because um, you know, space at the university, no one was a student and I wasn't on faculty yet. So it was really hard to come by spaces. And so we had to kind of get leaner. So we just decided on a core group of people um, and started offering residencies in different universities, mm -hmm. which I think was uh, a good way to go. And we worked with a lot of composers Um, and we were sort of a resident ensemble in different um, different parts of the U.S. Uh, working with young composers. So the, the instrumentation is quartet, string quartet, piano, harp, voice, flute, and clarinet, yeah. plus Chris Young Hoon Kim, the conductor. And, um, and so students, composers could write a lot of different instrumentation pieces so we could pull different um thing different ensembles out of that larger context um yeah yeah it's... i i remember personally to have wonderful experience with brain new works and if what you were saying i mean absolutely right of, of this being brave you know to 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 get acquainted with a new piece yes. that you have never heard before i think i think that's such an amazing um moment you know to 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 have this this the score or, or or and to and to do something that you believe is the piece is about you know i i think that's that's really such an incredible um opportunity as a musician to 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 be able to play a piece for the first time yeah most of the time right for brain right music. i always say to my students too when they play new music can you Imagine that these people have never heard this music before. So you're the first person that's introducing it to them. And sometimes I think of it really as a learning a new language, like the mm. syntax of the music, how, how the notes are put together. Uh, I ha it takes me a while to start speaking in that language, you know, but it's, it's just like spoken languages that, you know, the more languages, you know, the easier it is to, to learn another one because you see how things are put together. Yeah. Um, but it is sometimes there's such a risk that you're taking because you don't know if you're going to make it to the end of the piece, right? Um, <laughs> the, that's the that's the one of the funnest things about Brave New Works is that there's a very special kind of energy when we're on stage performing together. There's there's this sort of I I love playing with that group yeah. in particular. I I have had the most beautiful memories with with Brave New Works. Actually, I don't know if you remember this when we did a, a project with dancers and choreographers and composers yeah i think i don't remember maybe seven of them each of them yeah 
That was the Cage Cunningham. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, and it so was it was sort of modeled after the collaborations between Merge Cunningham and, and um, John Cage in New York. Yeah. And I think, I, think the, I think the amazing thing about that project, I remember, is that we, we got all together a Saturday with the pieces. The idea was that they were not, they shouldn't be finished. That was the idea of, of the, so each, each work was in progress. So it was really, I remember we stayed all day um, uh, playing the pieces, talking to the dancers, to the choreographers, to the composers. I, I remember that being a very, very special project. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a great deal of kind of improvisation. I, yeah. Do you remember that um, the challenge was that musicians had to think like dancers and exactly. dancers had to think like musicians? Yes. And then there was some, each group had like a parameter or two or by, from which to work. Yeah, it was very cool. It was very, very cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's really important to do those kinds of Absolutely. Uh, challenging. Well, Maria, Maria Sampen says, we, because she's part of Brain Works, right? Yeah. All still play together as much as we can, despite the fact that we are living in opposite sides of the country. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Emily Olson, remember Emily? Emily Olson? Yeah. She Formerly says, Perryman. this is so valuable. Thank you for and sharing the vi vibrant memories, artistic concept and challenging the mainstream. Thank you, Emily. Vivian, Vivian ah. Thank you, Alejandra, for doing this. H hugs to both of you. And, and I also want to say thank you to all the people that are watching us. Alexis Vallejos, who is a guitarist from Chile. He's a wonderful musician. Uh, Justin Bruns, our colleague from Michigan. Veronica Barahona. Jorge Peña Portillo, who is a, a friend, a, 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 a violist from Venezuela originally, but he lives in the States. And he, he's also doing wonderful uh, musical projects. And Carmen Burmeister, which is a friend from, from my hometown, also a violist, who we went to school together when before me in at Michigan. So mm -hmm. thank you everyone for, for joining and for, for being here with, with us in this beautiful conversation. Katri, um, I remember, uh, well, we played together in a string quartet, the Rocille's string quartet, remember? Yes. And I, we used to rehearse just about every day, but but at least Monday, Wednesdays, and, and Fridays. Yeah. And, um, um, and we did a lot of repertoire. We, we really, you know, tried to work really hard on, 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 the, on the quartet. Mm -hmm. I, also, I also see that you are doing a lot of chamber music. You have chamber, chamber groups. Tell me um, a little bit about them. And, and I'm also very, especially curious about your trio that you have. With. I have a lot of trios. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you curious about? <laughs> the, the E3Q one? Yes. The, yes. The one? Okay. Yeah. Well, so the, I'm just going to do an overview. Um, yeah. uh, Muse, Muse Ensemble, actually Maria came right before quarantine and played with us as a quartet. It's with Iwa Stern, the violist, and Kyoko Kashiwagi, who's a Japanese violinist. Mm -hmm. who performs at DSO. And we have a, a string trio, kind of a core group, and then we invite, invite other artists. And um, we've had that for a long time now. Mm -hmm. I, we started, actually in our first year, three of us were pregnant. Wow. So Kyoka <laughs> and I have daughters that are only three months apart in, in age, which is, is pretty funny. And they're both 16 now. So that's how long we've been together. I guess it's an easy math to count. Um, and then um, I'm in a new court, a trio, piano trio. And that's an interesting trio too. It's called the Jarnefeld trio. And this is with two other Finnish musicians who live in the States. Mm. Um, the pianist is actually the great, great granddaughter of Jean Sibelius. Wow. And so she has, um, she has a lot of connections, let's put it that way. Um, so it's nice, we've been able to play a lot of Finnish music. Mm -hmm. 
um, and then we discovered that we're related uh, because my great 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 grandmother was <laughs> the cousin of her of I know Yannefeld who is Sibelius's wife. So mm -hmm. uh, strangely, we are like seventh cousins or something like that, which is why we named the trio after our our family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the E three Q which is the trio, the experimental trio that you were asking about. Yeah. So that's with Mark, mm -hmm. Kirsten, my husband, and Mike Gould. Uh, all three of us are on faculty at the RC. And so we started playing together. It's cello, trumpet, and drums or percussion. And um, it's kind of a genre-less. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard to, you know, put words to this, but um, I think it's mostly structured like jazz in some ways, somewhat structured like free improv. So we have tunes that we play and then we can open them up to mm -hmm. improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's pushing me as a cellist because I have to take the bass role a lot of times, mm -hmm. but it's also pushing Mark and I to figure out how we could reverse those roles where I could not play rhythm, not play in the um, bass, but actually also take on a more melodic role. Mm -hmm. And Mark's also a composer, and so he's written some tunes for us. Um, the one that is right now is out. It's called Lonesome Luke. It's a, it's just a cute little song. That's um, it's it's. The story is, is kind of like, do you know who Lucky Luke is? Like the, the character in a comic? Yeah. Lucky Luke. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is, this is the vision of, that I had is Lucky Luke riding into the sunset, right? And that's what that piece kind of reminds me of. So the percussion is kind of like the hoofs of the horse. Mm -hmm. And then the cello is doing some kind of a strange tango line, you mm -hmm. know, um, but, um, Bum, bum, that kind of thing and then mark plays this i mean he, he wrote this tune in finland on our summer sitting on the on the dock in our summer house it was it just kind of came to him <laughs> so that's that's one of my favorite tunes but we do all kinds of stuff so very experimental you know try doing different things um lately we haven't we keep talking about how what we're going to do next, but yeah. <laughs> uh, bueno, we, we are in conversation with Katri Ervama from Michigan, from Ann Arbor. Uh, in, in our first conversation, uh, reconnecting musicians, musicians reconnecting, uh, and I call it Yumi Chile, just for the connection of Yumi and Chile. <laughs> I thought I had to play with that. And um, and um, I'm, I'm so I'm so happy that that we're doing this and and I I like I said before uh, it's just such a such an special treat for me to me too. It's, 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 I'm making myself a treat to 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 do these conversations. Um, uh, Katri, um, I, I, I was just curious because you were talking about this, this trio with, with trumpet and, and, and percussion, and, and you have these other two trios, more, more traditional trios. Mm -hmm. um, do you, do, does it happen, does something happen to you with, with your mind in terms of, of how you approach these, these, these different groups? Um, no, no I'm, not, I'm just talking about your mental attitude nothing to do with them with the not even thinking about the members of the of the of the of the groups but no I, yeah the process of improvisation versus uh -huh. the process of of um reading music and that um you know i find that there are so many connections in group improv and in chamber music mm. because the process that where you in when you're improving and you're kind of reacting to each other, uh, it's like real time composition, right? Um, and sometimes things really work out and sometimes they don't. But I find that it is a different place where I go in my mind. Mm -hmm. But what I find is if I can get into that space when I'm playing chamber music, then there's a, 
a much greater freedom to make music in that moment too. And so I try to kind of, instead of separating them, even though they are really different processes, I try to bring aspects of one to the other. And I'm kind of going back to your question earlier about why chamber music is important. And I think that in a small group, when you're rehearsing without a director, um, each member has to develop a kind of a sense of what their role is at any given time. And you have to understand what that role is. And so you do your analysis in a string quartet and the cellist is sometimes the motor that keeps things going. And sometimes the cello plays the line, you know, so at any given time, you have to have an understanding of what your role is. And when I'm improvising, um, it's fluid like that too, but good music is always good music, right? So if you have no idea what your role is, it's much harder for the end result to make sense. And so I think that the bottom line is that we're trying to make sense of sound mm. and how we organize that sound in, in improv is, could be totally free, but it really never is totally random, right? Mm. Because there is an organizational aspect to it. And so finding how what you make up makes sense with how that other person, what the other person is making up is really kind of exhilarating. And in a say in, in that kind of way, it's sort of like the turning the other side, right? In, in classical music, we analyze the score. So we decide how that makes sense. Mm. Right. Um, and we know our roles beforehand, but we know that we have to shift them. So it's, it's kind of, it can be really difficult, but it's also very cool to develop those techniques where, um, yeah, it's actually like, I've got, gotten really into brain science lately. <laughs> I um, love that. <laughs> and so how that, how your brain works, mm -hmm. um, when you're role shifting, you know, like we don't really, we don't really multitask, but we can switch tasks really fluently. Mm. And this whole thing of how, how the left and the right brain work. So when you're looking at your own part and then you look at the other person and you're always going out, you know, we're actually switch tasking constantly. And so we develop that sort of executive control of our brain, which really comes to play in a lot of parts of life. And so I think that in chamber music, because it's so independent and because it's so, um, each person has to really be in control of their own voice and how their own voice fits to the other voices. Um, it's really like a microcosm of humanity, right? Because then if you're sensitive to how you compliment the other person, you can trust that one day you'll get the voice too, the lead voice too, right? And so um, I, I, I just find that yeah. so cool well, about humanity. This, this could be for another hour. Yes, of course. Uh, but it's, it's, it's now 12, but since we were a little late, I want to continue a little, just a little bit more. And, and, and following this, this um, what you were mentioning, I have, a, I have a philosopher that I follow. Uh, his name is Jiddu Krishnamurti, uh, an Indian philosopher. And I remember reading about him and he, he, he said that there's a, in his mind, there's a huge difference between concentration and attention. When, when you have concentration, you, you concentrate, but you don't have any idea what is happening around you. Mm -hmm. But when you, are at, when, you are, when you have attention and you are attentive, you are concentrated on what you do, but also in relationship of what everything is happening around you. And I mm -hmm. thought it was really interesting because sometimes in music that happens, you know, uh, that you can be playing, listening to yourself and have, having no idea what is happening around you, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's such a different experience when, when you, you play uh, and you know what is happening. Because in a way, the, the whole process is, uh, is improvisation because you never know what the other person is going to do. Right. And you have to be in the present, you have to be attentive to, to react. So I, 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 I am with you there. And, and yes, with, with the, how do you say, neuroscience, 
Neuroscience, yes. Neuroscience, that's something that it really fascinates me, <laughs> how, yeah. how to know how the mind thinks. Um, Maria Sampen says, this is beautiful, Katri, you need to write this down. <laughs> Tom Lanshut, hi Tom, he says, hi guys. Sabine, so wonderful to connect with you all here. And so, Katri, um, I want to thank you for, again, for, for being here, for sharing a little bit of your life um, with, with all of us and to know where, what you're doing these days. Um, let's keep connected because life is much more fun. <laughs> Right. One of these days we'll make a project. We tried a couple of projects yes, together, right? Yes. But we didn't. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm playing again. I'm playing violin again. Uh, so um, I promise that we will do something together again to, to reconnect musically. Yeah. Well, so so this, is, this is very fun too. You know, we, we can just talk forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's something there's something about the language of music that we cannot express it in words. It's just the feeling of, of being there with, with, with the other person. I just, that, I, I guess that is the reason why we make music, you know, to, to, to have this feeling of, of completeness, you no know, wholeness. Uh, yeah. So, so Katri, I want to thank you for, for being in the first conversation, for having the courage to, to wow. be the first one. And, um, and I apologize for the beginning for our technical difficulty, but we're learning in the process. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here. And, and I invite you to, to the next Sundays. We, have, we will have conversations all the way until Christmas. So everybody's welcome to, to join and to ask questions and, and if if I have not invited you yet from the University of Michigan, please write to me because I would love to connect. So thank you everyone. And I will see you next Sunday at 11 a.m. Bye, Katri. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>